Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Monday Night Lecture Series. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Lori Carnett, and I had the honor to serve as the Explorers Club president for three terms. Today, I'm heading a charity that I helped found called Next Breath. This organization works to improve the air quality that children breathe around the world. And cleaner, more breathable air is what brings us to our guest speaker tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Edwards. David is a scientist, inventor, and writer, and was a professor of, practicing of, of the practice of bioengineering at Harvard University through 2019. In that year, he founded Century Cloud in Cambridge, Massachusetts. David has pioneered the science and technology of aer aerosolized drugs, vaccines, and respiratory hygiene innovation. Among his many contributions in this realm is the new respiratory health salt product known as FEND. In addition, David's research has led to the founding of the future food company called Incredible Foods. Besides his textbooks in applied mathematics, David has written several books on creativity and the creative process, and he has won many US and international awards including the Time Magazine Best Invention Award in 2014 and again in 2020. His new hygiene protocol has, based on the natural functions of the body was also listed by Fast Company as an idea that will change the world. Welcome, David. Thank you so much, Laurie. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So we're talking about air. Uh, COVID-19 has triggered a new focus on the air that surrounds us. And, and um, so what have we learned from all this? Uh, well, that's, yes, it has. And we've learned a lot. Actually, there's uh, both scientists have learned a lot um, uh, and uh, uh, learned a lot that only a few scientists knew prior to the pandemic and also discovered a lot during the pandemic. And then, of course, the public has learned a lot. So there's a number of uh, learnings that have happened here. Uh, and one of the consequences is that we understand a lot better um, how we breathe and how we become infected through airborne infection and also how we transmit infection. And maybe really briefly, I'll say that when the pandemic began, uh, there was a general uh, impression in the scientific community that uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID-19, uh, would primarily transmit through the large droplets that you might see with the strobe light when someone coughs. And that was the general understanding of how uh, airborne transmission occurred prior to around 2000, um, largely because we couldn't really see the smaller particles. Uh, it became clear um, and leading to a letter, as probably most people know, in July by a number of aerosol scientists, the WHO, an open letter, uh, that these very little droplets that we call respiratory droplets that are created in the airways when we naturally breathe and when we speak and other respiratory maneuvers, these droplets, which are generally much larger, much smaller than one micron and therefore move through and around masks, most masks, are the primary uh, vector for transmission. And that um, has been uh, eventually acknowledged by the CDC and the WHO, but it's taken time. Uh, we've also learned a lot about where those droplets come from, uh, where anatomically they come from, also why they vary between one person and the next or uh, in your lungs and my lungs in the course of a day, a week and the year. So there's a lot that's been learned. I agree. So can you tell us a little about FEND and how it came to be and how does it work? Just to backtrack a moment, I, uh, my, my career began, as you mentioned, in applied math, and I uh, had the fortune of meeting Bob Langer at MIT in the late 90s and published a paper in science uh, related to inhaled insulin and uh, delivery, uh, sort of weaponizing of insulin to deliver it to the lungs in a very uh, uh, simple way. And so when the anthrax uh, scare happened in uh, 2001, I uh, was invited to Washington, D.C. to help the government um, understand how to prevent uh, anyone from uh, weaponizing anything. And it led to an observation uh, in the early 2000s in a publication in PAS um, that we made that if you place uh, salt water, um, and as probably everybody knows, your airways, your lungs, your body actually uh, contains salts. And these are largely salts that are in the ocean for reasons that I can describe. Um, 
you actually reduce dramatically the number of these respiratory droplets that are generated. And so we published this and, um, and, uh, and, and developed it to some degree. Um, to answer the question, what is FEN? What happened when the pandemic occurred, um, began in uh, March of uh, last year, I, uh, I brought the, um, uh, some of the publications and a lot of the work that had not been published in the 2000s uh, when this issue was, uh, became less of a concern by 2010 to the FDA with Bob Langer um, and Janet Woodcock, uh, who leads the drug division, and uh, with a proposal. And the proposal was that uh, should we deliver these salts through the nose, uh, and your um, audience may not understand or know that when you deliver salts through the nose, which has been done for centuries and centuries, the FDA uh, uh, regulates that, um, uh, depending on how you talk about it, as a cosmetic, um, as a cleanser, um, kind of like soap. And uh, so it would allow us to actually get right into humans. And so our uh, supposition was that we probably could have a really big impact on respiratory droplet generation simply by a nasal uh, salt uh, that was designed with particles that would land right here in your uh, trachea, uh, main bronchi, where uh, these droplets form. Anyway, uh, we got into the clinic and have now since then done six uh, human uh, studies and uh, seventh ongoing right now. FEN came out in the late last year. Uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a product uh, that looks like this. Actually, it it, um, it uh, maybe doesn't look like a product that you develop for COVID nineteen. Uh, and in fact, we rushed uh, a lot of the work that we were doing in a factory um, uh, science and technology uh, to market with FEN so that we could uh, help uh, people in the pandemic. And the product uh, has been selling since late last year. It's about 10,000 people using the product around the country, uh, but we've mostly been using it to understand um, uh, how what we call now airway hygiene works and have done a lot of human trials uh, with it. Um, so that's uh, briefly then, FEN is a new hygiene. It's the equivalent of washing the hands for gastrointestinal disease, uh, but for um, washing the airways or cleaning the airways for uh, respiratory disease. Thank you. So um, you spoke a little bit about your studies and I know that there's been ongoing studies in India where there's been a very high level of virus. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's anything you could tell us about those findings so far. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for everyone's sake, there's obviously, when it comes to infectious disease, a few ways that we um, uh, protect ourselves. Uh, there's a hygienic uh, approach, uh, there's a drug approach, and there's a vaccine approach. And um, uh, what may not be known is that uh, the real fundamentals of hygiene, which go back a very, very long time, of course, but modern hygiene and uh, washing of hands particularly really goes back to this Civil War uh, period, at least here in the United States. And, um, and uh, the first uh, ivory soap came out right after the Civil War. So it was a major um, uh, uh, disaster, human disaster, really, the Civil War that led us to sort of discover uh, that hand hygiene, um, even though it's not a drug, could actually save lives uh, in, uh, in, um, in uh, the surgeries that were so uh, widespread during the Civil War. So we're in a similar situation where a lot of hygiene innovation has happened here, in addition to drug and vaccine innovation. And so what we've been focusing on is the hygiene. And, um, and uh, so indeed, when the pandemic uh, hit hard a year ago in uh, India, um, we were invited to um, uh, by the Azim Premji Foundation to uh, uh, work with uh, uh, medical staff at Bangalore Baptist Hospital and explore whether uh, 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 airborne salts, uh, nasal salts, which you may all know uh, have been used for a very, very long time in India, uh, but now again, designed with a high calcium content and uh, with droplet size to get to this upper airway region, whether we could uh, have an impact on cleaning the airways. And so we published some work actually in your journal uh, in late in the year, Molecular Frontiers Journal, showing that it's uh, very effective. Um, but what happened, uh, Lori, is that in the winter, we were um, doing a study in COVID-19 uh, patients in Bangalore. And when the uh, uh, Delta variant began to spread as um, uh, rapidly as it did, uh, the decision was made to begin to treat uh, incoming uh, patients, so a randomized uh, um, control study uh, 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 with a uh, nasal saline control uh, was uh, started um, in the uh, in the February time frame and uh, we're just uh, now um, uh, submitting for publication uh, the, the the research and so I'll just very high level describe 
uh, what we found um, uh, remarkably, we found that uh, treating three times a day administration of this salt um, and uh, uh, has a significant impact on lowering symptoms and also raising um, oxygen pressure in the, uh, in the blood, which is a, a measure of um, uh, your lungs ability to bring oxygen into your blood. Uh, and also reduces um, IV steroid and um, and antibiotic use uh, relative to the control. So uh, we're uh, very hopeful that a really simple intervention, which of course salt and water is uh, everywhere, uh, could be um, uh, very impactful. And particularly in those populations uh, like in India uh, today that may not have immediate um, access or maybe even ever access to uh, vaccines. So thank you. So um, this goes, uh, from what I understand, beyond the virus, however. Um, is that clear? It also yeah. it works against other pathogens. Um, you know, poor air quality, as you know, is still the number one killer, or yeah. is and probably will be in, de in the developing world. So your audience may understand that uh, the um, uh, intuition and, uh, and to uh, some degree um, data uh, over the centuries has led um, uh, uh, people um, uh, to um, expose themselves to uh, high salt concentrations for a very long time, not just for uh, uh, airborne infection, but also for chronic respiratory diseases, particularly in Europe in the uh, 19th century, as uh, industrialization began to dirty the air uh, and respiratory diseases became uh, preponderant. Um, it was noticed in uh, some places that those who were not getting respiratory disease were actually salt mine workers. And so the, um, the modern uh, therapy of halo therapy, which is uh, uh, bringing those with chronic respiratory disease into salt environments uh, was developed. Um, so we're learning a lot more and uh, without getting into too much detail here, we do know now that, that the main function of salt in your upper airways is to hydrate your upper airways. That's really critical. Um, your uh, audience may understand that the dry environment is really bad for uh, not only uh, COVID-19, but also for asthma and COPD and other respiratory diseases. Any disease that is uh, provoked by particulate matter getting deep in the airways is one that can be um, helped by your upper airways cleaning uh, the particles better. And that happens when they're better hydrated. So yes, the um, the, the rationale for airway hygiene uh, 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 it relates to uh, respiratory disease quite generally, uh, both airborne infectious diseases and, uh, and chronic respiratory disease, which is, as uh, you're alluding to, Lori, have been uh, rising uh, really dramatically here for the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, so one of the reasons why I really wanted to get you, um, interview you for the Explorers Club is I was thinking about some of the things that you said um, from the point of exploration. And I know in some of your talks, you often speak of our sensory disequilibrium with our environment and its relation to our air and why this harms human health and eventually harms our relationship with nature. So one of the goals with exploration is that we, when we go into the field, we wanna leave no trace, but clearly unless we can control our exhalation, we're indeed leaving a trace. Um, if you think about it over the course of history, there's been many examples of uh, explorers exploring new territories where unintentionally they brought disease um, to indigenous populations. Um, this is still the case uh, through today. So how do we prevent this? Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, to just reiterate for everybody's sake that if we could reduce respiratory droplet um, exhalation and frankly inhalation, we would uh, eliminate the primary vector for transmission of airborne uh, uh, infectious disease. So really independently a variant or uh, uh, airborne infectious disease. So um, now let me just take a step back and say that uh, uh, with regard to our senses and what has made me really fascinated by the air, uh, not only uh, does the air we breathe uh, bring into our bodies particulate matter that could be carcinogenic or uh, allergenic or pathogenic, but also brings in uh, to our um, airways uh, molecules that uh, stimulate our olfactory system. And uh, the olfactory nerve is the only nerve that goes, sensory nerve that goes straight to the brain. Uh, most of the olfactants that are stimulating and shaping our cravings and our 
uh, food addictions and and uh, and uh, passions for food uh, are actually coming from our mouth uh, through the air into our uh, into our um, olfactory uh, bulb, and so the air is bringing into our uh, bodies uh, with every breath we take uh, signals uh, that are actually radically different than they were a uh, hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, and uh, consequences to that um, are twofold: one is to us, and the other is to nature. With us, uh, cardiovascular disease has risen dramatically. A lot of the signals that have come to us through the industrialization of food are olfactory signals, signals in the air. Uh, respiratory disease, number one killer in the developing world, is almost becoming the number one killer in the developed world uh, the, at the pace things are going. Nine out of 10 people are breathing uh, polluted air. And, um, and other signals uh, that are uh, disrupting sleep and, and worker wellness um, all relate to the air and the air we breathe. So you could say, Lori, that uh, we're in a situation where we are almost at war with the uh, environment around us, and uh, uh, and it goes two ways. So my argument uh, is that our survival uh, on the planet, um, uh, long before we had an FDA or food guidelines or understood um, the idea of air pollution, has been an intuitive sensorial one. And so we've been dependent on nature and, and coexisted and survived with nature. And the importance of re-establishing that equilibrium with nature is really critical, not only for us, but for nature around us. Particularly in exploration, as you have mentioned, uh, and we've talked a lot, uh, Lori, about um, in coming into a uh, virgin uh, a natural environment, um, it's uh, um, arguably most critical that the uh, exhaled uh, aerosol cloud around us is not bringing uh, infectious um, organisms uh, that could be infecting uh, the environment around us. And, and we may also, of course, be uh, receiving uh, uh, infection from the nature that, uh, um, of course, has been the predominant um, mode of uh, infectious disease transmission um, uh, uh, over the last uh, several hundred years. So the rationale for airway hygiene, and indeed, when we bring uh, FEND out uh, this September, uh, it will be in a form factor that looks like this. I actually have it around my neck right now for the Explorers Club here, just to sort of illustrate how this works. It's a very simple, uh, inexpensive uh, device. There's no uh, preservative. It's only salt and water. Uh, there's no batteries. There's no metal. Uh, you squeeze it, and there's a cloud that comes out. I don't even see that. This is just in salt mist, dark droplets, just right to land right here you breathe in, you spread your nose you breathe really deeply and you do that twice every six hours uh, and the uh, consequence is that the number of respiratory droplets you're exhaling are uh, 75 percent on average lower uh, for several hours and um, and the benefit again is both to uh, the natural environment around you uh, and uh, and your vulnerability to the natural environment um, I, I believe this is a particularly important tool for exploration, um, especially in view of what we've experienced with this pandemic. And as we know, um, there are certainly more pandemics that have the potential to arise. Um, I think for anyone who is out in the field, it's, it's a consideration that we have to take into account. Yes, I think, honestly, um, I'm hopeful you know, obviously, this is just a horrible um, uh, crisis that uh, we're going through right now, and uh, and it's unfair. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we're we're learning to think differently about the air we breathe, and and uh, recognizing that the air we breathe, we're sharing with everyone else uh, and with nature. And so, my uh, I, I mentioned the hand washing um, uh, uh, transformation of uh, of uh, hygiene uh, back in the 19th century. I'm hopeful that coming out of the um, a pandemic, we will just think differently about hygiene and it will become an intuitive uh, um, uh, act uh, to clean our airways um, as regularly as we brush our teeth or wash our hands. And um, and uh, it'd be, it'd be, if we, we, I think we need, Lori, to move from the um, from the 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 the, the because of fear and worry and and uh, and cognitive uh, recognition that we're harming nature and uh, to to a point where we're just naturally um, doing the uh, the intuitive um, uh, kind of logical thing. I, I agree. So um, I'd really like to thank you, uh, David, for your time today and for this important message on how we can, especially as explorers, best protect nature. 
And um, so I'd like to thank you for your time tonight. I'd like to also thank Ann Passer, Kevin Murphy, Richard Garriott, Will Roseman, Louis Muga, and Alex Serrano, and all the other Explorers Club uh, staff who have helped make this program possible tonight. And we are looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank everyone for uh, listening in from so many different places. And there's quite a few questions already. Um, David, we have a number of questions asking to see the product and if you could just explain and show us how it works. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, Fend uh, currently looks like this. Uh, it's a product that we, as I mentioned, uh, rushed uh, to the market at the end of last year. Uh, you tip it over and it creates a cloud of mist. Oh, and when you tip it over and breathe it through your nose, a deep nasal inhalation, uh, you do that twice. Uh, there's about 100 uh, doses in a single device. The device that we'll be launching in um, pre-launch in August and be available from uh, September 1 on is this uh, device. And it uh, can be hung by a lanyard around your neck. It will cost $14 and you squeeze it and it sprays and it has a hundred uh, doses in it. Um, and once again, you just spread it at your nose and it, there's the deep inhalation that lands the salt aerosol uh, on your uh, trachea and your main bronchi. Okay, thank you. So now um, one of the questions is uh, relating to the variants. Uh, you spoke about COVID, but um, do you have any information on how effective this is against variants or? Yeah, well, Again, it's helpful to think about hand washing as an analogy. Um, the benefit of hand washing is it's really uh, effective against any kind of a, a bacterial or viral gastrointestinal infection. And the same thing is true for airway uh, hygiene. Uh, we are particularly um, in, and uh, we have been for the last uh, nine months doing um, studies in uh, India and in Bangalore, Bangalore Baptist Hospital, and are um, just uh, in the process of submitting uh, an article on a study that we uh, began in December and uh, just now concluded in uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, 87 patients. And uh, what's interesting about the study is that we began the study uh, where the Delta variant was um, uh, just beginning uh, to uh, spread. And by uh, May, uh, the predominant um, infection uh, uh, sequenced in Bangalore was the Delta um, infection. And so what's is, is, so it's very interesting to see both the effectiveness of the FEND um, intervention. And so we looked at um, a uh, three times a day um, administration to those who are coming into the hospital with a COVID-19 uh, positive infection and are not yet in need of oxygen. And um, uh, both without uh, divulging the results, um, uh, it's effective uh, relative to a controls randomized uh, 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 two, two arm study. But what's also really interesting is that the, uh, you see the different signature in the um, aerosol um, spread uh, from the, um, the uh, variant that was preponderant in December to the Delta variant in, in June. And the Delta variant is, is many more times um, aerosolizable. So there's much more um, uh, aerosol in the air with the uh, Delta variant. Uh, so bottom line, the benefit of a hygiene intervention is that it's really agnostic to not only the variant, but also the type of pathogen. So uh, what you're saying, does that indicate uh, why the variants are so, so more uh, contagious? Or yeah, I think it, it the, uh, there may be many reasons why it's more contagious, but one of the uh, reasons that's implicated by this study is that the um, the, the virus uh, and viruses generally emit surfactants, and surfactants um, coat surfaces like mucous surfaces, and the addition of surfactants causes mucous surfaces to break up more easily, uh, which is something we've shown in uh, multiple studies. And so, what's very likely happening, and it may be one of many things going on with the variant, is as new variant new mutations occur and they have different surfactant signatures, 
uh, those that are breaking up the mucus surface more effectively inevitably are more able to spread than those that don't. So you can understand why a mutation um, like uh, the Delta variant would suddenly become the predominant variant. It's just more getting more in the air. Now, there may be other um, aspects of the uh, mutation that um, are at play, but that from this study seems to be true as well. Thank you. Now, here's a, a question from Cynthia, um, who talks about uh, uh, the long COVID um, as one of the most tragic parts of this pandemic. Um, and so she's asking, do you think this could help with uh, prevent post-viral illness? Uh, and, um, a great question. And I think that um, I and probably we don't know enough about um, what the um, uh, causes are of uh, long COVID, but just to uh, point out a couple things. In our work with Chad Roy, who uh, leads the aerobiology group at Tulane, um, and, and, um, and we published an article with him a, a couple months ago, where he, among a few labs in the world, had been looking at um, in, in a large animal model, had been looking at um, COVID-19 and, and, and long-term uh, uh, residents of um, a, a virus. And so it's, it's, it's likely that um, a virus remains in, in uh, certain tissues. Um, and so one of the benefits of the hygiene in that regard is it's uh, whatever the um, viral particle, or frankly, it could be a carcinogen or an allergen, uh, that is in the upper airways, it is uh, limiting the traffic of that um, uh, uh, contaminant uh, deeper in the lungs. And so any symptoms that are associated with uh, deeper lung infection, not necessarily COVID-19 infection, but obviously pneumonia and other kinds of uh, um, uh, lung infections uh, would be benefited by, the, um, by this uh, airway hygiene. I should also point out that uh, one of the, as your audience probably understands, uh, the olfactory nerve uh, has is is the only sensory nerve that has a direct, a direct link to the brain, and so there's just two synapses between the um, between the olfactory receptor and the hippocampus, and therefore some of the effects uh, that we've read a lot about, maybe some of the audience has experienced, is a loss of. Um, the sense of smell and therefore a flavor perception. And, and that um, effect uh, uh, could be modulated by nasal delivery, but frankly, um, that's a pathway to neurological effects that, that really go beyond uh, just an airway hygiene intervention. Okay, thank you. And um, assuming uh, someone has the vaccine, that does not necessarily uh, take care of the issue of exhaling the virus. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, yeah. And I, uh, so uh, because the uh, vaccines on the market today are not um, mucosal vaccines, we're not um, immunizing uh, through the mucosal surfaces. So one of the strategies for future vaccines is to deliver the vaccine um, yeah, in the uh, airways, um, which uh, would, um, if effective, produce a mucosal immunity. So I think that's the long-term direction. In the short-term direction, you, we can all be vaccinated and the virus can still uh, land in our airways and, um, and, uh, and live in our airways. Um, and so to your point, Lori, you can be a host. Um, that also, uh, to the degree that you're sensitive, uh, susceptible to breakthrough infection, you being a host of the infection is not going to help your chances of avoiding that. So in general, um, having uh, airway hygiene uh, before, during, and after infection uh, is both protective of your own um, uh, uh, lungs, but also uh, those around you. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question from Deborah, and she asks, uh, is the salt that you speak of, is it just regular salt? Uh, well, it, in, in a way it's regular salt. So these are salts that are in your body. And so and they're also in the ocean. And so they're, they're pretty, they're everywhere. Um, they have a, uh, a ratio and a composition that have been uh, designed um, and that we've sort of discovered uh, works. So to be really clear, uh, the two salts in the solution are sodium chloride, that's table salt, and uh, calcium chloride, that's not table salt, but it's something that you can find. And, and again, the ocean has quite a bit of the, the salts that are especially effective, and we've shown uh, why that's true, I'd be happy to talk about that, are what we call divalent cations. And so uh, calcium and magnesium chloride, they're both in the lungs. 
Um, we uh, deliver these salts uh, to the lungs at a higher concentration than uh, uh, anyone has delivered uh, uh, to date. Uh, to be clear, the salinity of the solution is more or less the salinity of the ocean. So this is not a, it's a salinity that the body is, is uh, used to um, uh, receiving. And um, uh, the, the, the calcium exposure, if you will, is, is similar to what you would get um, from a magnesium salt if you were near the Dead Sea. Okay, thank you. This is um, somewhat related in that um, th uh, this person is asking if water can build up fluids, inhaling water can build up fluid in the lungs, which is a medical problem, and inhaling salt salty water can irritate the airwaves in people with asthma. Can you talk about these risks? Yeah, absolutely. So to be clear, uh, our airways our lung, from our lower airways to our upper airways uh, are um, coated with water and salt. And um, when, so just a little quick lesson on what happens when you breathe air in general. Uh, beyond your carina, so you're, you have your, your, uh, your mouth, you know, your, your larynx then gives, uh, opens up into the trachea, which then branches into the main bronchi. And uh, from that point down, all the air is 100% saturated with, uh, with moisture. So when you breathe um, any, pretty much any air, uh, your, uh, the, the water in your upper airways is actually um, evaporating and moisturizing the incoming air. And that's really essential to our survival, honestly. So water's coming out of the upper airways and then particles are coming onto the upper airways. So there's this uh, constant water evaporation and the way that the upper airways bring water into the, uh, into the airways to um, make up for the water that they've lost is through salt. So when water evaporates in your upper airways, it concentrates the salts that are there and that pulls water out of the uh, epithelial cells by um, osmosis. So, um, in general, water and salt is really critical and, 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 and why it's important to have salt exposure. And I should just point out wherever people are today, they're breathing salt uh, and water and moisture in the air. So that uh, the planet and our environment is, uh, um, the, the, the air in our environment is, is, uh, is full of sea salt. Um, and, and, and that's just because two thirds of the planet is covered with sea. And, and so the salt that is highly concentrated near the seaside is actually that salt goes up into the atmosphere and ends up coming back onto earth. So pretty much wherever you are, you've got some salt that you're breathing in. Now it's, um, it's, it's true that there are some conditions now, um, uh, where delivering salt, uh, deep in the lungs may or may not be a, 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 a good, um, uh, strategy. Uh, as maybe the, uh, uh, the person who's asking the question knows, salts are delivered deep in the lungs for um, all kinds of respiratory conditions, including cystic fibrosis. But what's also important to understand is that we're not doing that. So the, we're delivering the salts only to the nose and the very upper airways. And that's exactly where the airways need salt and actually accumulate salt to keep themselves hydrated. Last thing I wanna say is that dry um, air uh, and evaporation of moisture and therefore, indeed, high salt concentrations uh, tends to be uh, a very bad thing for the uh, airways and ends up promoting particle movement deeper in the lungs. And so the uh, hydrating of the upper airways through salts and, and waters is quite critical to um, upper respiratory health and ultimately lower respiratory health. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a couple questions, uh, fairly similar, and you've in part answered them, but because... Uh, Several people are asking, I'm going to um, ask you anyway. So they wanna know if, if Epsom salts are good for bathing or anything else. And uh, what about salty steam bath? Um, are either of those uh, yeah, so so in in, in uh, so I, I can't really comment on um, pretty much anything that relates to getting salts in your airways. I will take those questions, and so I'll just focus for the moment on the uh, steam bath with salts. So, um, and, and I'm gonna, I, I don't recall if we mentioned this earlier in the program, but um, the exposure of um, those with respiratory, particularly chronic respiratory illnesses, to uh, humid, salty environments has a very long history. And, it, and it, it, it goes back to, um, frankly, Roman times, but it, it definitely um, became a practice in the 19th century in Europe, and that was quite um, common. So uh, steam um, uh, with salt is, is, uh, is, um, is, it can be good. Uh, 
it really depends on what else is in the atmosphere. So one of the benefits of the caves or halo therapy kind of environments is that um, you pretty much have no allergens, uh, there's no mold, um, and it's just water and salt, which is a good thing. Uh, once you get to a very humid environment, you can have mold and you can have other um, things that are carried in the, in the, in the droplets. So steam baths might be a bad thing, really depends on what else is in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, because this uh, is geared towards explorers, I have an explorer question here. Um, so as explorers, we do and will travel the world. Is there any possibility of FEN being used in airlines that transport us around the world and deliver us to wilderness places where we don't want to introduce pathogens? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that the um, from September, uh, our effort will be to get um, these little objects in every seat in every airline. So um, using this uh, before you get into the plane or on a long trip, taking it twice. Um, if everyone did that, you would uh, lower, uh, based on the data to date in, in hundreds of uh, human subjects, you would lower the aerosol that's in the atmosphere by 75% and have a really significant impact on the probability of infection, not just, uh, not just COVID-19. Um, particularly for those of you who are going into a virgin um, natural environment, uh, it's quite essential to uh, be sure that your air is as clean as it possibly can be of respiratory droplets. Uh, so even if you may be breathing out germs that will not infect you because your body has a uh, natural immunity to it, you are all aware of the fact that that may not be true in nature. So um, the better than a mask when it comes to these little droplets, uh, just getting rid of those little droplets um, is, a, is a very smart thing. Thank you. So here's a question on how long can you be a host of a virus or carry it in your nasal passage? Uh, well, it depends on your uh, immune system, but in general, when it, it depends on the virus, but when it, in general, when it comes to um, COVID-19, a typical time course of um, exposure, proliferation and elimination would be about one to two weeks. And so, um, the number of 10 days has been focused on um, uh, because that's kind of what it ends up to be. And, 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 uh, and what happens in that um, success scenario is that uh, you'll see a growth in um, viral pr uh, proliferation in the, in the upper airways and the nose uh, from day one up to day four or five, could be six. And then your immune system begins to eliminate it. Part of that elimination is the mucus clearing uh, um, pathogen to the, um, to the mouth, which is what um, FEN helps mucus do. And, um, and then you're, you're clear of infection. But uh, if your immune system is weak, um, the virus could stay for a much longer period of time. And that's when your probability of really severe system symptoms uh, goes up. And, and the audience probably understands this, but the severe symptoms of COVID-19 is true of um, many, if not most respiratory diseases, is when the, um, the contaminant, um, the allergen or the pathogen gets deep uh, in, the, in the lungs uh, because your uh, lower airways are not made, uh, they're really made to uh, absorb oxygen. They're really not made to pick up these uh, 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 dangerous particles. Um, and the longer you have a uh, uh, pathogen in your upper airways, the more likely that is to happen. Okay. Thank you. Here's a question um, you'll find interesting. Uh, this is from Scott. He says, because FEND is a particle agnostic, does uh, this imply that there are broad indications which FEND can potentially serve i.e. all respiratory? Yeah, well, I, so, um, uh, I, I, I like to make the soap analogy often because it's familiar and, and we're all comfortable with soap today. Uh, but the audience probably understands that back in the middle 19th century, people, nobody really thought about using soap uh, as a, a daily hygiene, uh, particularly to avoid infections. And, um, and the Civil War um, came and, and it was found that having soap in soldiers' bags helped them survive. And, uh, and therefore the first uh, ivory soap came out after the war. Um, but data matters. So um, what I'm gonna say is just based upon what we know and also what science makes us believe. And, and then just to say that 
time needs to play out here. We've already learned so much here in the last year. So uh, in general, respiratory droplets will carry anything that is a contaminant that you breathe into your lungs. So let me make, let me make it clear that when, depending on where you live, uh, you are breathing in between 100 million and 10 billion particles a day. And, uh, and of course, our ancestors sat in caves and burned fires and, and, and breathed a lot of particles. And so your, your lungs are prepared for that. Um, uh, and uh, the way they handle that is that most of those particles you breathe in, uh, again, car carcinogens, allergens, pathogens, and um, other things, uh, fall out in your upper airways, your nose, your mouth, and this part of your, uh, what we call the uh, conducting or the non um, uh, um, gas exchange uh, regions of your lungs. And so you have a mucus uh, that captures those particles. And if everything's working right, sweeps those particles within several hours to your mouth where you swallow um, them and, and, and uh, they're eliminated. And that's how uh, your, the natural mask uh, sort of works. Anything uh, that would provoke uh, a COPD, asthma, um, RSV, uh, pneumonia, um, uh, by penetrating deeper in the lungs will, will benefit by not getting into the air from the mucus and actually being just swept out uh, through the mouth. So we believe, and I'll share a little bit of data here, um, that uh, uh, airway hygiene, uh, just like washing the hands, is uh, broadly uh, as, 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 as beneficial to the prevention of respiratory disease as hand washing is beneficial to the rest of the prevention of gastrointestinal disease. Now, you can wash your hands every day and still get a stomach uh, um, infection. And so it's not a, it's not a silver bullet, but it, it um, almost certainly lowers the, um, the probability of getting an infection. Um, and I think it will be true for COPD and asthma and all of the diseases that we've, many of the diseases we've seen growing at uh, alarming rates here over the last uh, few decades. Um, what do we know? So we have um, uh, two papers that we'll be publishing uh, here uh, later this summer. Uh, one, which is um, uh, demonstrating that uh, the hygiene, uh, the salt delivery to the upper airways is producing uh, this, this, uh, this cleaning of the airways very similar to what happens in a humid room, or frankly, what happens when you put on a mask. So this hydrating of the upper airways can be done by putting in water or putting in salt, and they both kind of work hand in hand. What's different about uh, FEND is that it lasts much longer, and that's the calcium and the magnesium effect. And so you can uh, um, breathe it into your upper airways and it will uh, clean the airways for four to six hours. Whereas a, a humid room or walking near the sea will just help you for about an hour after you leave that. And so there's, now I say all of that because there's quite a bit that's been learned here in the last several years about the benefits of hydrating the upper airways for asthma, for COPD and for other uh, respiratory, uh, particularly uh, um, infectious respiratory diseases. And, um, and then uh, the, the only really concrete data we have right now um, uh, are uh, on both influenza and, uh, and uh, COVID-19. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, this one is in from Ali um, from Ireland. And she's asking, uh, should we be more alkaline and what's the absolute best way to do this? Is it through something like FEND? Well, um, so um, the, um, the pH uh, of our solution is a physiological pH. There are some benefits to an acidic pH in terms of uh, preventing microbial growth, but um, because of our, our system is, is sterile, uh, it, 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 we only have uh, water and salt and there's no need for preservative and the pH is, is uh, just physiological pH. Um, there are some benefits or, or uh, um, 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 uses of uh, uh, varying uh, um, salinity or alkalinity, uh, if you will, but uh, we don't do that. Uh, we're really just focused on the salt effect. Um, is this the absolute best way? Uh, if you ask any scientists, is anything the absolute best way? Presumably, there's always a better way. And so what we've um, um, learned uh, over the last 20 years um, is that um, the, uh, the reason why uh, a calcium, so a hypertonic calcium or magnesium salt uh, works best, uh, given what we know, and I, I would say that the, 
Dead Sea is probably a good um, is a, is a good um, parallel. So if you're near the Dead Sea, that's probably a good um, option. Uh, is that um, it has this uh, longer term uh, cleansing effect, uh, and it has to do with the uh, interaction of calcium and magnesium with um, anionic surfactants and mucin molecules. Um, but uh, they're also in the body. And so it's not like you couldn't use other kinds of um, molecules and you could, uh, but um, then there's the issue of clearance. And so we're just putting into the physiological milieu what's already there. Okay, thank you. So um, here's a question on where are some of the worst types of airborne pathogens? Where, where are some of the biggest concentrations around the world? Uh, well, um, I think that, uh, this is a, um, uh, it's a great question. So it, it depends a little bit on who you are. Um, and it, and it depends. In other words, some of us would be more, um, uh, um, at risk uh, than others. Um, and, and, um, I should also just point out that when it comes to, um, defining the, uh, risk of a pathogen, there's uh, both the risk that if I get infected, might I die? And, uh, and some, um, uh, infections are extremely mortal. Um, uh, and, uh, and then uh, Ebola, for example, and then there's other pathogens that are not so uh, risky. COVID is one, but extremely um, contagious. And um, honestly, uh, as we've seen here, if you could sort of def um, identify the worst case, um, it would be a pathogen that is as um, 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 dangerous to our health is COVID-19, uh, not only with the uh, risk of mortality, but also uh, with the longer term effects. It mutates very rapidly and it's extremely contagious. So I would say that today, uh, the worst place to be is in a very polluted air environment where vaccination uh, against COVID-19 has not um, been widely um, adopted. Uh, and, um, and there's some obvious places right now. And, uh, unfortunately, Southeast Asia is, is really suffering in, in some places in, uh, in, uh, in South America. I think that it's reasonable to assume that, um, later this fall, um, we'll probably have another visit of, um, uh, the pandemic. I don't suspect that it will be like what we've been through, but, um, uh, watching closely what's going on in India, I think that the, um, uh, there's, 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 uh, unfortunately a little bit more to come here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the, um, it seems like one of the positive, uh, things about this product is this is something you can take anywhere, anytime. Mm. Um, you can protect yourself wherever you are. It's something naturally to your body. Um, so here's one of the more practical questions from this evening. Um, someone's asking, where can this be purchased? <laughs> uh, well, um, so you were leading me down a road there that I was uh, walking along, but let me just say that the place to purchase this is hellofen.com. And uh, the product that you can purchase today is this product. Um, and uh, uh, by August, um, we'll be selling the, uh, pre-selling the pocket version and, uh, and then uh, distributing it in the, uh, in, uh, in September, hellofriend.com. Okay, thank you. And I want to, first of all, thank everybody who tuned in tonight from all over the world. We greatly appreciate it. And I want to thank you, Professor Edwards, for your time. David, it's been great. Um, and I want to remind everybody who's um, watching from the Explorers Club uh, that next week is going to be the GLEX event in Portugal. So you'll be uh, receiving a link for that. And um, you will be given a code to sign into the GLEX event. But in the meantime, for all of those who are traveling, you might consider um, taking your friend along with you and protecting each other and protecting our wildlife. So thank you again, David. Thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you all. It's really fun. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.